Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Presbyterian Church tonight. Uh, we'll be together for however long uh, we are together. And uh, my target would be 40 minutes, so I hope that all works for you guys. My name is Paul Fair. I live in Vacaville, and we've lived there since 1964. Uh, we have four children, 16 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. And I've been in the area of sustainability for about six years now. I've uh, spent about, I don't know, maybe five or 6,000 hours on the subject. I don't know everything there is to know about it, but I do know a bit about it. And so we can talk about it from A to Z. Um, and if there's something that we, that, that's on your mind that's, that's a question mark, uh, around this whole topic, by all means, we'll stop and chat about that for a minute. We'll try and stay on target, but if there's something that, uh, that we need to wrap up tonight because it's our last time together, by all means, we'll take time to do that. And we'll try and do that all in 40 minutes. And the subject that we're going to aim at specifically is green jobs. And the slides will be off to my right here, as you guys can tell. And green jobs and sustainability, do they exist? One of the things that... Um, that that happens in my world as I teach students at the college and we've launched a green education program over there. The, the college hired the firm that, that, that I work for, which happens to be my company. Um, they hired us to install a green education program at the college a couple years ago. And so we have done that and since we've been there, we've trained over 450 students and so we've had a, a number of them come through the doors on an average of 300 hours of study per student. So they've studied quite a bit. So we're gonna do something in 40 minutes that they do in 300 hours. So you can imagine that we're not gonna cover much and talk about much, but at least something hopefully that'll be of some value. Um, but in that student population, a number of them are unemployed or out of work or underemployed. And it's a fact of life. Uh, the un unemployment statistics, I wanna give you some good news about that. Uh, from my perspective, because I follow that, and our students uh, that we have in our classroom remind me of that all the time. Um, but I want to give some good news. The state has been at 12.4%. We had kind of a, a uh, exponential climb in this, the unemployment statistics over the last three years. But I, I want to say this, since March of this year, we've actually started trending down, okay, a few tenths of a point. But from my perspective, that's good news because we hit the top of the plateau and stayed up there for the last six months. So it's not like we are kind of hitting a little soft spot and going to climb again. It looks to me like we've kind of, we peaked out and maybe started turning the corner. That's what it looks like. And so we can be hopeful about that and, and believe maybe there's some good news on the unemployment front in that regard. However, saying that, we still noticed that some statistics that came out of Washington just recently, this past week, gave our president another black eye around unemployment. You may have read that recently, and it is in the news, and, and so we'll see where it all goes. Uh, maybe one other comment about unemployment, uh, the realities of it here in our county, is Benicia is somewhat favored in terms of having the lowest unemployment rate in our county. So you guys are favored in that regard, and I'm grateful for you guys in that. Uh, I do teach students from Vallejo, and that's kind of the most disfavored or unfavored area in Vallejo. And it's also tends to be a little bit ethnic related or background related from that perspective. We have, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the black African American population in Vallejo tends to be the hardest hit in the area of unemployment. So these are realities. These students come to my, my classrooms and they sit in the classrooms and we talk about these things that we're going to briefly touch on tonight. And their, and their interest is to learn something, to build skills that enhance their vocational viability going forward. And that's why they come. Um, the good news about the program for the first 20 months that we've had it, it was paid for through the stimulus money, through the federal stimulus money that, that uh, the President Obama pushed through, that 700 and whatever it was, $87 billion. We got a chunk of it over there at Solano Community College. And since we received it, we were able to put that program on at no cost to the students. And consequently, it becomes popular in that regard. People come because they don't pay anything. Um, going forward, we just submitted another, in, another grant um, two weeks ago that is a continuation of the grant we just finished. We'll see. There's no guarantees. Uh, I never thought I would be a grant writer, but, but I have been over the last uh, couple years. I've written quite a few, actually. 
Uh, and it wasn't something I ever aspired to do. It's just something I kind of fell into because I'm in this green world. And these grants are green, and, and so they get green people to write them. Um, we've been a little bit successful in that. We, we also were able to, to land another grant that's starting this summer. It's an alternative vehicle grant, electric vehicles and hybrids, and it'll be in the maintenance area. You probably have noticed that there's quite a bit of activity in the electric vehicles, hybrids. California's kind of embracing that idea. There's some statistics about how many hybrid vehicles exist in the nation. We have the biggest chunk, okay, here in California, and, and that was before this last push that we see right now. So we'll see continued, we'll see continuing progress in electric vehicles and hybrids going forward. And by the way, there's no, there's, 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 there's really no way we can avoid that, from a, to th that to occur because of, and you probably learned it through these discussions, fossil fuels are declining, cost of fuels going up, and that kind of prompts and, and stimulates the electric vehicle or alternative vehicle marketplace. So you'll see more of that, and the, and the grant that we were able to achieve was teaching people how to maintain those so we can actually keep them on the road. There's a little hole in the marketplace for trained technicians for alternative vehicles or electric vehicles. So that's the next, kind of the next chapter that starts this month. And then we go back into our full-blown program of the entire green education process. Now I say that to, to say that I believe that's a, a, a good program. I may be a little biased, however, but I think it's a good program. Um, and it's a good program to, to uh, provide training for unemployed, underemployed people, but it's also a good vocational pathway for students that are pursuing educational uh, pursuits in the engineering architectural fields of sustainability. The market is really wide open in that regard. Um, so one of the things that, you al that we always hear about green jobs is where are they? I mean, I, I've heard that and I understand that and, and we study that and we take a look at that as best we can and, and put our hands around that. And let me suggest to you that there's good news about where are the green jobs. I believe there are. And, and let, me, let me tell you a, a reason I'm convinced of that. Uh, I've never been busier in my life than I am right now. That's the honest, goodness truth. It's, it's, a, it's a full court press nearly every day, seven days a week, to keep up with what comes my way from green opportunities perspective. And I'm not bragging about that. I'm not, you guys. I'm just telling you, it works. And I want you to know I've been studying it for quite some time and earned a number of credentials. So it's not like it's a get-rich-quick scheme, because it's not. But if you have the right background, the, ed the right educational uh, uh, check marks on your resume, so to speak, and you understand the subjects, you will be a very busy person in the area of sustainability. I believe that's a fact. There's a number of people that work in my organization. We're all going as fast as we know how. So that's good news. And we'll, we'll talk about the study about green jobs and what they all are, some of the titles tonight. And, um, and we'll look at those from the, from the statistical vantage point, and I'll also try and interject as much as I can, regardless of what the, the uh, statistical research um, provides, I'll try and give you as much of a personal glimpse of that as possible from what I see and what I experience. And, and the two coincide, but I'll be able to at least talk from an experiential point more so or equally as from a statistical research perspective, okay? So that's where we're going to go tonight. I hope that when we're finished that we have a, have a sense that uh, the green job marketplace is a good place to be. Um, I feel fortunate to be in this, in this uh, profession or in this area of sustainability. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I took an interest in it about six or eight years ago. It caught my eye because I was in the construction uh, environment doing architectural engineering work. And I thought, wait a minute, this, look, this makes sense to me. And, uh, and, and I started pursuing my educational processes at that point in time, and it's worked out well for, for what I do. So, Unemployment, there are people that, uh, that are unemployed. I work with them every day. There's a sad reality of that. There's the people, my students who are unemployed are people. You know, there's, there, there's, there's, there's real live people sitting in the chairs of my classroom that are in a bad situation. I can tell you that that's a, rat, that's a fact. And there's, and there's scores of them. There's a lot of people unemployed in, in, in Solano County, and they come to my classes and sit in there, and I hurt for them, and I'm sure you would too. I don't know what your employment status is, but when you're around that group of people a lot, you start, start uh, empathizing perhaps with the, the situation that they're in. Let's talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> you've probably touched on a number of these subjects tonight, but I at least want to establish some, some uh, 
motivational background to why sustainability makes sense, not just from an ecological perspective or an environmental perspective, because it makes sense on both of those topics, but it also makes sense in terms of, of it's a vocationally viable area to be in because of some of the realities of why, what drives the sustainable marketplace. So we'll talk about that just a little bit. So it's, it's just not all of us trying to find things to do. There's some reasons behind the scenes or behind the curtains that are driving the marketplace, whether we like it or not. Okay, so we'll at least establish that as a ground, a ground floor basis that we all can kind of, kind of uh, consider or thought, think about. And the, left, the bottom left hand of that particular uh, slide is the global population. And this is some projections going forward. You may have seen this data. Uh, right now we're around 7 billion people. The different shades and the different uh, arcs that we see going forward around 2100 are some of the prognostications about where the global, ec global population will land. And if we kind of cut a middle, a middle number, there's some, there's some thoughts that we may peak out around 10 billion people. And you can, we can study this population kind of uh, information and we can kind of make our own, dis our own decisions about how much we believe one of those numbers or another. Maybe one particular case in the most uh, conservative per, uh, perspective, maybe around 5 billion. And perhaps if we go unabated by 2100, we're going to be at 16 billion. Why does this drive the sustainable marketplace? Because people consume energy all over the globe. Okay, and where does energy primarily come from? Fossil fuels. Okay, and we are, and as population grows, demand for energy continues to climb, and where, and, and where we find our energy generation pri from primarily, where our energy generation comes from, from, from primarily today, is fossil fuels. And we know that we have a finite amount of fossil fuels in the known and projected reserves, and the faster we take, them out of the ground, the shorter the time frame is between now and when we've, we've exhausted them. Okay, that's how it works. And from a research perspective, we believe on the fossil fuel crude oil standpoint, and, there's, and we'll look at a, a piece of information here in a minute, but from a crude oil perspective, the guesstimate right now is 60 to 90 years left and it's done. And so we've enjoyed crude oil for 200 years about, in, our, in terms of our entire um, civilization existence, in terms of the entire society um, track uh, or, or historical perspective, about 200 years, it, it was a wonderful energy source, and then it's gone. And the, 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 the good news is, is we had, we, in our lifetime, we got to enjoy that. Um, the bad news is, is one more of me, and it's not there anymore. Okay, because I'm over 60 years old, and, and if, it's on the, if it's on the worst case scenario, but if one more of Paul fares, and there's no more crude oil. And that's the single largest source of energy in the world. So what is going to backfill that vacuum when the crude oil is gone? And what is going to happen to the cost of crude oil as it continues to deplete? And again, crude oil does what? It creates finished products in the diesel family, in the naphtha family, in the jet fuel family. We call these middle distillates. They're, part of, they're the middle of the, the crude oil barrel. The upper end of the crude oil barrel is where the gasoline comes from. And then the very upper end is what propane, methane, ethane, propane, butane. That's the top. And the bottom comes out with some real heavy oils like Bunker C and or Coke. Okay, the final bottom product we can't do much with is Coke, C-O-K-E. And so, but all those products have some use. And, and, and we utilize them by what? Burning them. We consume them, we burn them, and, and, and we burn them when we produce heat, and that's where our energy comes from, the expansion of gases relative to heat. So 60 to 90 years, crude oil's gone. Be, uh, natural gas has a larger future. Coal has a longer future, but they, again, they are finite resources. Now, you may hear something about natural gas that says, hey, we're finding a lot in the, in the New England states these days. You may have heard that. And the fact of the matter is that's true. We are fracturing solid rock, granite strata down below the surface of the earth and freeing up natural gas where before we didn't know how to do it. And so we've, we've uncovered another way, you know, technology has improved to the point where we can get natural gas now from previously unavailable sources. And that's all true and has extended our lifetime on natural gas. Natural gas has more years ahead of us than crude oil does. 
Uh, and you may have also heard that the tar sands up in Canada are going great guns these days. And the fact of the matter is that's true. Okay, the, when crude oil gets up about $120, $130 a barrel for Arabian light sweet crude, it, the tar sand, the recovering of the tar sands and recovering the crude oil out of the tar sands in, in Canada becomes more economically viable. And that's where we are right now. It's, it's, it's a good bet to go up there in Canada and start mining out the, tar, the oil that comes from the tar sands in Canada. But we still know how much is there. It's not like we've, we've hit another mother load and we've extended our time for another 100 years. That's not the case. It's just become economically viable to extract the reserves that we knew was there to begin with. Okay? So that's just a little bit of background around fossil fuels, and we'll continue on. So people use energy, and one of the, one of the key areas that, that people use energy is they use energy because we eat. Okay? In food, the... the, the, the the, the food cycle from planting the, to eating and at the table requires energy all along the way. And so we are, we, not only do we use it driving our cars and turning our lights on or heating our homes and all those sorts of things, but just the fact keeping people alive demands energy because of the whole world of, of food production uh, to keep people alive. So people and energy, people go up, energy demand goes up, energy resource, reserves go down in that whole process. One of the things that, that is uh, a sobering reality is, is we have been trending down in the United States in crude oil reserves ever since early 70s. Boom. You know, we continue to go down. That's, there's, there's, that's, we, are, we've stuck all the straws in the United States that we have, and we've depleted our reserves, and that'll continue to, to happen as we go forward, and we're going to become what? More dependent on outside sources of crude oil as this reality continues to go forward. That creates some homeland security issues and creates some political instability with the people that we, buy, that we deal with and buy our products from and the crude oil from. And that's no surprise to all of us. The Middle East is, is kind of a tough, a tough partner, but they are the suppliers of our crude oil, a, a chunk of it. And unfortunately, we have some political uh, instability that goes along with that whole marketplace. So it's unfortunate that it is what it is, but it is that. So as we continue to deplete our own reserves and resources, and we still have the same energy demand, right now in the United States, we consume about 19 million barrels of crude oil per day. Okay, every day, 19 million barrels of crude oil is what it takes to run our, run our country. That's a lot of crude oil. And we think, well, what about, for example, what about the, the, uh, the reserves that we put down on the ground in the Gulf states those, those emergency reserves. Have you guys heard about those that we store down there? Uh, how, many, how many days do we have with, that, with those, that, the national storage of reserves down in the, in the Gulf states? How many days do you think we might have if all of a sudden the people who sell us crude oil stop? How many days do we have of emergency reserves? What, we, what would we guess? Two months. 30 Well, <laughs> it's actually like around 60 or 70 days, okay? So there's something there, but 60 or 70 days, okay? I mean, something's got to change in that time, or we're in trouble. We've got, we've got problems. So um, we're going to have to fix the world if something tragically or, or, or catastrophically happens that they shut us off. We've got a couple months to uh, figure out what we're going to do about it. Do we, do we recognize that if we stop... If we stop oil refineries from making finished product, do we recognize that nearly our, all of our society will stop functioning? Do we kind of get that sense? That's, where, that's the reality of it. Every, nearly every part of our society utilizes finished products that come from crude oil, and if that stops, we stop. Things don't work, okay? And, when I, and, I, and I attended a lecture once where a guy was really adamant about this topic, and he's real blunt about it. He said, just so we know, just so we know, when energy cuts off, nothing happens. And he's, very, you know, he's, he's a real well-renowned guy, and you know, he can say that. And, and, I, and to a certain extent, he's right. And so there is some real sobering realities if, in fact, we have a crude oil problem going forward. Let's look at this slide. This is always kind of an interesting one. Um, this is known reserves, and, and not only known reserves, but expected known reserves. And as you see over here in North America, there, there's where we are. And it's maybe a little hard to see the difference in colors, but there's, 
a light color on the bottom, and there's a lot of black in the middle, and there's a kind of a brownish on top. And in the United States, we have a lot of this dark color. Do you guys see that? Okay, and, and what would that be, do you think? What do we have a lot of in the United States or North America? Coal. Coal. we got a ton of it. Is that good news or bad news? Yeah. <laughs> is it good news or bad news? I mean, is, or, or is it both? What's that? What's that? If you're a buyer or seller. Um, what, do we primarily, what do we primarily use coal to do in the United States? What do we do, what do, we do with it? Power Say that one more time. Power yeah, it's, it's electrical generation. It is the primary fuel source for electric generation. And we love that, okay? Because we are people who really enjoy electricity. In the United States, people will live here. By the way, we see statistics about our... The, the, the amount of energy that we consume per capita uh, uh, versus every, any, anyone or everyone else in the world. Do you think U.S. people cons, uh, consume more energy per capita, about the same or less than compared to any other country in the world? A ton more. Okay, it's like, it's like twice our closest relative. Okay, we are, we, uh, for lack of a better word, we are energy hogs. Okay, we are. It's a fact of the matter compared to the rest of the world. And where does, and where does our energy that we enjoy so much, when we plug our, plug, our uh, plug into the wall, where does it come from primarily across the United States? Coal. Okay, now that's the good news. We got quite a bit of it. Okay, we don't have much crude oil, and we don't have much natural gas, but boy, we got a ton of coal. And so, and, and so when we think about coal, we got a lot of it. You know, we, you know, we can say, gosh, we feel a little better. The, the homeland security issues aren't quite as bad because we got all this coal. But what's, there is a downside to coal, is there? Is there? <laughs> is, oh, there's some downsides, okay. Let's, let's kind of list, what, what do we know that we don't like about coal? What are some of the things we don't like? It's dirty. It's dirty. So when we say coal is dirty, and oh, by the way, we have to kind of understand what dirty is, but the fact is it is quote unquote dirty as long as we define dirty in some, in some, uh, in some reasonable fashion. Yes, ma'am. Have I been there? Where the curtains are black. Where the, what is black? The dust. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Coal dust. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's talk about coal for a minute. Just, let's talk about the, un, the unfortunate realities of coal. Coal is an it's, it's a energy-dense product. By the way, why we like, why we like crude oil, it's energy-dense. Okay, let's, let's think about that for just a minute. If I had a, if I had a gallon of, 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 of uh, finished gasoline, I've got a gallon of gasoline that, that, that I, and I'm carrying around in my hand, and I go stick it out there in my 2,000-pound vehicle and pour it in there, how far will my 2,000-pound vehicle go on that one gallon of gas? 20 miles, 25 miles, 30 miles? And now if we went out there and thought we were going to push that car for 20 or 30 miles, do we get a little bit of a sense on how much energy it would take for us to do that? And we get all that power out of that gallon of gasoline. This stuff is energy-dense. And, the, and, the, and that's one of the wonderful things about the finished products that come out of crude oil. And the heavier that the product is, heavier meaning, we, we took a look at this a moment ago, gasoline's up here, what we call middle distillates down here, inside this middle distillate family is diesel. Diesel's heavier than gasoline. The heavier it gets, guess what? The more energy that it has in the product itself. And so by definition, a diesel-powered car of the same weight, as long as the, the energy, I mean, the efficiency of the, of the motor is comparable because we had some real good technology in gasoline-fired in, uh, in, engines right now. Not quite there yet on the diesel side, but given the same energy efficiency of the motors, which one's going to get the best gas mileage? Diesel, because there's more energy packaged in it. And the heavier we go, we get down into this coal world, a lot of energy. That's the good news. That's the good news. A lot of BTU content. When we, when we look at energy, we talk about BTU content. And there's a ton of it down there in that coal area, as well as the heavier products in the crude oil barrel. All that's good news. It's got, and the reason it has all that energy, because it has more carbon in the molecule than lighter components of the crude oil barrel. Are you guys with me? The lightest end of the crude oil, the lightest end of the crude oil barrel, or recoverable fossil fuels in the United States, is methane. Right? And methane is what we call also natural gas. It's what's piped to most of our homes. And the chemical formula for methane is what? CH4. CH4. Right? CH4. One little carbon and four hydrogens. And it's very light. 
It only has those four little hydrogens in there, so you don't get a lot of combustible energy out of it. There's not that much BTUs, okay? It's not a very dense molecule. It's kind of a light one. That's why we can't liquefy it very easily. Hydrogen being the most light, okay? No carbon at all in it, just H2, right? But when we go below that, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, what happens? More carbon, more energy, more carbon dioxide emissions through the combustion process. The off gases of the combustion process continue to climb as the carbon in the molecule continues to grow. Everyone okay? And so we're now here in coal. A lot of energy, but what happens? Tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And we're concerned about carbon dioxide emissions because we find that we, they are related to climate change in the world. And I want you to know that, that I study these things and I talk about these things and I research these things. And from my, from my perspective, I believe that the carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere, there's un, it's undeniable that they have climbed. And they continue to climb and they're climbing at a steeper and steeper rate all the time. And where is it coming from? Primarily right now it's coming from the combustion of coal, not, not necessarily in the United States, but the electrification of India and China and all the new coal plants that they're putting online week after week because they're bringing electricity to all the billions of people who live over there, which they deserve, but they're doing it with coal and unfortunately it has a ton of carbon dioxide that comes out the stack at the end. And that's unfortunate, but it's real. That's one of the dirty reasons of coal. It's, it's, but that's not the only reason, okay? We also have noxious oxides and toxic emissions that come out of the combustion process of coal that are also toxic in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is not toxic. It tends to have some heat impacts in terms of the ability of the planet to release heat back into space. And that's the greenhouse gas uh, problem. So coal has two problems. It has a lot of carbon dioxide and it has toxic emissions that kind of come with it. We are becoming much better, and we've known for quite some time, by the way, how to clean up the toxic emissions. We get that part. And we also, kinda, we also understand how we can take that carbon dioxide and what we call sequester it and, can, and quit releasing it to the atmosphere. We've become better at that. But the cost of doing that is horrendous right now. No one's willing to bite that off too big. Okay, we know how to do it, and the, the size of the equipment that it takes to, to actually accomplish that is, 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 is it's, it's a bad bet right now. If you look at some of these, these electrical generation plants, there's one in the United States on the East Coast, that they have really built the sequestering side of, of the uh, emissions to, re, to capture that carbon dioxide. When you look at the amount of equipment and the cost of that equipment relative to the cost of the amount of equipment and the amount of equipment that, that they're using to create electricity, it's like two to one. It's, it's, it's huge, and guess what? They're only getting 4 or 5% of it. Twice as much equipment for a little teeny sliver. And so we're a long ways away from figuring out how to economically and viably take in carbon dioxide and sequester it, put our arms around it, and put it someplace other than the atmosphere. We're not there yet. We understand it, but we're not there yet in terms of off-the-shelf technology. And when we look at some of these other countries, here we see the Middle East. And we see this big gold bunch down here. And so what do you think that might be? Oil. Yeah, oil. they got a ton of it. And here on top of that, they have natural gas. So they're, they sit over there on a, on, a, on a gazillion dollars. And we've known that for a long, long time. Okay. This is, I don't know if you've seen this slide before, but it's the... It's the one that tells the story that it's, it's interesting, this whole world of sustainability. We got into this little background work just so we know what drives a sustainable marketplace. What is it really creates jobs? And so I'm kind of introducing some of those reasons that are unequivocal. We can't really, we can't really argue about them. This creating a marketplace for sustainability. What we see here is the atmospheric carbon dioxide measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And if we continue this line, you kind of notice that it's kind of getting a little steeper. Okay, and right now it's around 385, 390 parts per million. That's a fact. And also what we notice on there is it has a little annual cycle. Do you guys see the little wiggle, little uh, sawtooth that's created there? And then when we blow that particular phenomenon up, it looks like this. In January, it's about middle of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It peaks out in April. It starts dropping the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and kind of bottoms out in October, and then it starts going back up again. Why is that happening? What's happening? That's a seasonable, there's something happening seasonably up there. You guys see it? And this, and this pattern repeats itself year after year. 
peaks, drops, climbs back up through, through, an annual, through the annual seasons. What's happening? I'm sorry? Say that one time. I'm sorry? Heating? Oh, heating. Oh, heating. No? Nope. Okay. Um, it, it has something to do with temperature. Um, well, in the wintertime, you notice that, that uh, it's kind of peaking right there, but the wintertime is summertime in, a, in the southern hemisphere, even though... Yep, a little closer to the equator, but, but essentially that's, that's, an, that's, an, that's, a, that's a possibility of an influence. But there's one other real big one. That's, it's huge. It's, it's what really drives this whole thing. It's the growing cycle of the northern hemisphere. Okay? Where, 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 we start really, where our plants start really popping out in the northern hemisphere is this part of the year. And then we start losing leaves. The, the, uh, the plants start going into their dormant state, those deciduous trees. And during that time, they don't go through this process of photosynthesis. There's not that much greenery around there. And so the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up. And it happens, it's called the greening in the northern hemisphere. And so when we look at the, the, the northern and southern hemisphere, what do we see right off the bat? There's a ton of land in the northern hemisphere compared to the amount of land in the southern hemisphere. You guys see that? And so what's happening is the greening of the northern hemisphere, starting in the spring, starts giving us all this opportunity to change CO2 to oxygen through the process of photosynthesis because of the greening of the northern hemisphere. And as we rotate around the sun, we're back on this side, now we're in winter time, and guess what? The leaves are gone, and we can't process as much carbon dioxide. The concentrations in the atmosphere go up. And aside from this little interesting reality that happens year after year, this is what we look at and this is what we recognize and we continue to see data year after year as it continues to climb. There's a lot of legislation out there. There's people who come together. There's people who plan and strategize and have global meetings. It's called the, the Conference of the Parties, the COP, Conference of the Parties. They try and put their hands around this, say, we're going to do something about this. This is going to kill us. We've got to stop it. And we're not there yet. We can't agree globally how to do anything about it, but we're trying and maybe we will get there sometime. One way or another, it'll be self-limiting because there are consequences of such things, regardless if we are proactive or we're reactive. We will get to the same spot eventually, one way or the other. Okay, so those are some of the real simple reasons why green jobs exist and why the being in the marketplace makes sense, because energy continues to be one of the easy ones we think about in terms of opportunities in the green marketplace. Green employment sectors, existing energy generation improvements. And what we'll notice going forward is, is, or, is entities and major oil companies like the one you have up here continue to invest more and more money to be more and more environmentally conscious. Okay, that's a fact. And the good news about that is they put people to work putting these systems in place that make them be cleaner operators while they continue to, to, to uh, de supply the United States with the energy that we demand. Uh, audits and evaluations, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but, uh, but uh, one of the things we do from a green technology standpoint, we have two companies, you guys. We have an education company, we have an energy company. And when we, when we get over, when we take our education hat off, we put our energy hat on, we, eva we evaluate buildings like this and determine how it's doing from an energy efficiency perspective, how it's doing from a waste management perspective, how it's doing from a water efficiency perspective, how it's doing from an environmental health perspective, and we make recommendations to people in terms of what they can do about that to improve them, that situation. And then we make those changes, and then after all that's done, we say, hey, by the way, we can do one more thing with your building if you choose to. We can put a renewable energy system on your building and reduce or remove your PG&E bill. And people like that, and oh, by the way, just so we know, the return on investment is reasonable, six, seven, eight, nine years. The amount of money that you're going to see at the end of the tunnel at 20 or 25 years, I'm talking about an energy bill, it's around $12,000 a year, $1,000 a month. The return on investment after 20 years on that type of scenario, what number do you think it would be? 300,000, 400,000, 500,000? Close to $600,000 that's been saved through that process. It's a wonderful deal. 
And, and those types of studies, and we call those pro formas, are very compelling to customers that want to do something about their business going forward. And so you study these things when you're involved in energy demand reduction. You, you study what the results are, and customers are enthused about that, and there's some, there's some subsidies and grant money out there that help them make easy decisions in that regard as well. So it's a good business, a good business to be in, and you just don't jump in it because you know something about it and become successful tomorrow. There's, a, there's some work to generate that business model, but I can tell you it works, and it works, and it works well. Building sustainability upgrades, energy water demand reductions, renewable energy systems and applications, biofuels and farming, transportation industry, water management, regulatory oversight, education, training, consulting, sales and management. I should have put one more on there too. It's grant writing, okay? <laughs> I was doing it this morning. I did it till last night till 11 o'clock. I delivered one last week, okay? It, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. Um, well, I've been fairly lucky in that regard, if that's the right word. Uh, I've gotten better at it, too. And so um, they, they, are a, they are a specialty all its own. Um, they're not fun, okay? I mean, I, I don't, I, maybe, maybe some people think they are. I mean, I haven't, I haven't found them fun. They're a lot of work. And there's always a time deadline on them. And they give you oftentimes two weeks to write a 75 pages document that is well researched and supports your argument. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's a ton of work and it's night and day. That's what, kind of what, what happens. Okay, there's a number of, um, and we're going to wrap up here really quickly, you guys. There's a number of um, organizations that study this whole world of what's going on in the green in industry. And I can tell you one of the best sources of information, this is called the Centers of Excellence, and they, they do good work over there. They really do. They look at what's going on out in the marketplace from an economic standpoint. What opportunities do exist from a green perspective? What are the professions really? What are the vocational uh, 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 opportunities that exist? Define the work. Define the pay scale. They do all that stuff. And they quantify it per region and per percentage and per, and per how many jobs you can expect in the next year, two, or three years. All that stuff's out there. But one of the best one of the best websites, from my perspective, that they keep up that data up on a real-time basis is the Employment Development Department website, EDD. And if you go into EDD and you go into their website for green jobs, they have got a wonderful uh, library to spend time in thinking about these things. And it's accurate data. And it's, and it's kept accurate because they also track the unemployment numbers as well. Centers of Excellent Research Objectives, I'll let you uh, kind of read that on your own in, in, in 10 seconds. Are you done? <laughs> anyway, they try and, they try and um, choose real measurable objectives when they study these things, so it's just not pie in the sky. They really try and figure out in a real sense what, it, what are the jobs, why do they exist, what do they pay, what are they described as, what's the job, so to speak, uh, description. Bay Region, they, again, pro they continue to generate this kind of data on and on and on and on again. Here's, uh, here's some more of the charts and tables they put together. Uh, estimate employment, three-year projected growth rate, blah, blah, blah. There's all, all that kind of stuff. Billing performance, retrofitting specialists. This is some, some of the things that our energy side does. You notice that it has 58% growth expected. I can tell you that's real. It's real. It's real. I see it all the time. Um, energy efficiency occupations, and again, if you want to just pick one out of here, so here's 16.8%. Energy auditors or home energy raters. Who are those people? They are called BPI, building analysts. It's a credential that people go to school for. Highly technical. It's not something you earn uh, in, in 10 minutes. It's highly technical. The tests are hard. So it's BPI, building analysts, is one of the ones that does that type of work. Another one for the state of California is called HERS-2, Home Energy Rating System 2. It's taught by two agencies in, in California, one being Cal Certs up in Sacramento. Again, very technically oriented. And those guys come into a building like this, they hook up their equipment, they run some tests, and they come and, 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 and two weeks later, they come back with some diagnostic information that is absolutely stunning. It's excellent. The software environment that evaluates how buildings operate and the technology that goes with that is, is at a high level today. It's not just smoke and mirrors. There's really something to it. 
So anyway, renewable energy, there's plenty of opportunities. Photo PV, we call it, uh, wind is in there, solar heating's in there, shallow depth geothermal. Uh, there's some R&D in fuel cells. But fuel cells have kind of shifted out of R&D. They're becoming more mainstream. Biofuels, we could go on. We could talk about that for an hour, but we won't. Batteries, biomethane, biomass, electrical generation, all those things are real. Uh, more energy efficient um, opportunities. You'll see a number of them in there. Here's more on the water side of life. Um, one of the things that happens, we're so, we're so focused on energy that the water guys kind of, they're a little bit out there, just kind of not, not gathering as much traction as the energy guys. But I can tell you waters is, it, depending on where you live in the United States, is a, is a bigger or smaller issue, okay? In the southwestern United States, and right now, those people who depend on Lake Mead, for example, are concerned about that. And do they have good reason to be concerned about it? There's no question about it. The Colorado River has been slowed down for so many years now in the, in the levels that's historical lows. And it's not only a water shortage down there that they're experiencing, but it's also what? An electrical generation problem because the water level's so low. Here's another interesting subject. You may hear some of this going forward. It's the R&D on vertical farming. I noticed you guys had some, some uh, neighborhood farms out there. And there's, there's good news in the farming. Why are we concerned about farming? Because why? High energy demand, high water demand, okay? And we can do better in farming than we do, and we know how to do it. And one of the ways that, that we've studied and, and, and we kind of put our hands around is a subject called vertical farming, fun subject. If you wanted to say, oh, I got 20 minutes, I want to do some research, you might want to put on your little notepad, I'd like to look at vertical farming. That's something. It really is an interesting concept. Came out of Columbia University, I believe. Student project. And now it's being embraced as being something of real, of real viability. Um, building, the whole world of lead participation, uh, sustainable building from design to operations, all this stuff exists, you guys. I used to teach these classes, and I still do. I taught this twice last year. And he is, here, he, these were my students for years, but now it's, it's so many others. It's everybody. And, and one of the things I've noticed on the unemployment side, when the economy is, when the economy is sluggish or, or sagging, people turn towards education. And, and I think they should. I mean, they want to build some skills, build some more employable skills, make themselves more marketable. So we see a higher incidence of, of education and people interested in it, and it kind of goes hand in hand with, with the loss of work. And it's unfortunate that's the case, but it, but it tends to ride uh, on that same issue. Anyway, you'll see a whole lot of other things that people can do, and uh, at some time, if you guys are interested, and you can talk to Constance, and I can send you these slides. It goes on and on. There's grant writing, by the way. Um, <laughs> on and on, it just never stops. There's, there's tons of things for people who are interested in this field to do, and thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay, you guys. <laughs> <laughs>